So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tzvi Galil. I am Dean of the College of Computing. Dean of the College of Computing. And my job is to introduce the speaker. So what the hell a Dean of the College of Engi uh, Computing uh, introduces uh, uh, the physicist. And by the way, the last time I dealt with physics was 700 years ago. So I'll get to it later. So it's really my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sylvester James Gates, or in short, Jim. Um, and uh, any introduction to Jim uh, will do injustice because the list is too long. So I'll, I'll just mention a few of the highlights. Uh, first of all, he won the Presidential Medal of Science. How many at Georgia Tech won one? One. Mustafa will say it. He's a member of National Academy of Science. How many in Georgia Tech are members? The same Mustafa El Sayed. <laughs> he is also a member of the first academy in the US, American Philosophical Society. How many in Georgia Tech? Same? Okay. <laughs> Pretty good company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll hire you afterwards. Uh, Jim was also a member of PCAST. PCAST is the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology that existed since FDR till Barack Obama. We still are waiting for the current administration to decide if they were going to have such body of advisors. Maybe they don't need one. <laughs> okay, I, I didn't say anything. No politics. So, and he will talk, you know, about will evolution and information theory provide the fundamentals of physics? I know half of the answer. Information theory and computer science, for sure. <laughs> they, pro they provide the foundation for everything. Okay, so, very humble person, you yeah. <laughs> uh, So how do I know Jim? Uh, that was about five years ago. Anybody heard about OMSCS? Raise your hands. You didn't hear about OMSCS? Yes. <laughs> Online master program in computer science, the largest in the world and the best. Uh, you physics students, you know, once you graduate, take OMSCS to enhance your job prospects. So in May 2013, uh, OMSCS was announced. It actually started in January of 2014. Uh, and Jim invited me to uh, PCAST. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, several days later, there was an article in the New York Times, the first of 10 articles so far in the New York Times. Uh, and I'll read to you a quote by Jim. <laughs> uh, that's why I fell in love with him. Perhaps Vigalil and Sebastian Tran will prove to be the right brothers, right with a W. Uh, of MOOCs, say James Gates, a junior at University of Maryland physicist who serves on the presidential, President Obama's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. This is the first deliberate and thoughtful attempt to apply education technology to bring instruction to scale. It could be epoch-making, really, if it really works, it could begin the process of lowering, lowering the cost of education and lowering barriers for millions of America. So Jim, therefore, is, uh, and he kept in touch, and he watched, and I, I sent him updates, and those of you get email from me, I'm the king spammer. Uh, Paul can witness. Uh, and he was in touch all the time, and I was thrilled to have such a, a fan. And I'm really thankful to Jim for, for doing this, because, you know, we have many challenges along the way, you don't always get the, all the support and the encouragement from within. To have somebody like Jim means a lot. So, Jim Gates.
So I'm sorry about the fumbling, but that's typical of me. Um, back in the 2010 period, through maybe five years ago, uh, there were these things called VHS recorders. And uh, you could have uh, DVDs, CDs running in your house, and you could program them so that they would come on and off and maybe record something on TV at a given time, maybe your favorite program, maybe you were binge watching something, just program it, videotape it all. And uh, I never learned how to do that. My wife was the person who learned how to do that in my family. So I always tell people that you don't want me touching technology because I know how to break it faster than the speed of light. <laughs> so first of all, thank you for, this. first of all, my friends, we, uh, we are in fact friends. We talk to each other several, I don't know, eight, nine times a year at least. Um, all around the marvelous works that the online course is doing. And you folks, it's, I was amazed that more of you didn't raise your hand because Georgia Tech is actually leading the world. Someone's laughing? <laughs> She's a plant, you know. I'm a plant? <laughs> Okay, well, she, she's a plant biologist. Then. Um, a planted biologist, okay. Um, but in fact, Georgia Tech is leading the world in the development of online learning. And that's something I recognize would likely be the case when I first met Zui in 2012, I think it was, 13. And uh, our report went to President Obama because he, in fact, asked us to look at this issue. They were called MOOCs, Massive Online Open Courses. And every university president said, we got a MOOC, we got a MOOC, they got a, you know, we got to get a MOOC. And so President Obama uh, tasked the council with looking at what these MOOC things were and whether it was time for the federal government to make a large investment of funds to bring them to scale to benefit the American people. And by the way, that's the kind of stuff President Obama did. The current president, well, we're not, we're not political here, so we won't comment about that. But in putting this report together, it became very obvious to me very quickly that the only example, and we looked across the country, and in fact, even internationally, the only example of a program that I thought had a chance to succeed was the program here at Georgia Tech. And I explicitly said that to many people, that if one of these, one of these experiments is going to work, it's going to be the one at Georgia Tech. And to my very great pleasure and enjoyment, it is the one that is leading the world. You have the most effective online learning course in the world right here at Georgia Tech in computer science. I believe that maybe last year or so in the entire world, Georgia Tech produced eight, seven, eight percent of the folks with uh, masters in computer science, something like that. Think of that, one school doing this. And so if you haven't heard about the online master's course, you might want to at least absorb some of the joy of saying, yeah, we're number one. Because in this, you are, in fact, number one. Okay, so. You can go home now. <laughs> that's right. I, this is just a paid commercial for Zui. That's exactly right. Um, but uh, in preparing for today's talk, one of the things I did is went back and looked at the last time I was here at Georgia Tech. And it was uh, February the 22nd, 1995. It was the last time I was here on the Georgia Tech campus. Now, I come to Atlanta fairly frequently. I was here in November. I gave a presentation over at Morehouse College. And typically, there are conferences here that I come to. But somehow, um, you folks haven't seen fit to invite me back until now. <laughs> so uh, you know, I'm, I keep it like Santa Claus. I'm making a list. <laughs> and I'm checking it twice. And so we'll see. I'm too shy, okay. Uh, and we'll see how soon I can get back to the campus. Because I've had a wonderful day in your physics department, and boy, did I get my mind blown in terms of some of the work that's uh, being done in the physics department here. So let's get started on an adventure. Um, the question is, uh, will evolution and information theory provide the fundamentals of physics? Now, I'm going to try to convince you that the answer is likely yes. 
the information part, as we has already said, that's, we, that's a done deal. But in fact, in theoretical physics, if you read the theoretical physics literature right now, you will find many, many examples of people at the very edge of the field who have become convinced that elements of information theory are critical to understand the basis of our universe. And this is a real switch. Back when I was in graduate school, uh, and I got my PhD in 1977, so this is the period 73 to 77, uh, there was a physicist by the name of John Wheeler who made this proposal called It From Bit. And what he meant by that statement was that it, being the universe, had to somehow emerge from bits as an in information theory. Now, I remember when I uh, first heard this, I thought, well, John Wheeler, first of all, you, many of you probably have never heard of John Wheeler, but John Wheeler was the advisor to uh, Richard Feynman. Maybe some of you have heard of Richard Feynman. He's a Nobel laureate. He was also the advisor to Kip Thorne. And if you don't know who Kip Thorne is, he's the guy who helped measure the gravitational waves about two years ago, and he also got a Nobel Prize. So John Wheeler, although he never received the Nobel Prize, was an extraordinary physicist, did lots of work for this country during the Second World War in order to make sure that this country was victorious. Just an incredible man. And uh, so Wheeler made this comment, and I remember hearing it as a young physicist in grad school, and I knew about his illustrious past, and so I said to myself, God, this guy is just such a giant in physics. But you know, he's getting old now. And you know, maybe his mind is beginning to go. And so you have to take what he says with, an element, with a grain of salt. So now, 30 some odd years later, I'm doing research. And I find that in my own, re in my own efforts, I got to his age. <laughs> but in my own efforts, not because I wanted to, because in fact, it just forced itself on me. Um, not because I wanted to, suddenly I found elements of information theory derived by me in my own research. And so I concluded that if you become a theoretical physicist and do it long enough, you too can go crazy. <laughs> so as I said, let's get started. Okay, so in our, our universe is an interesting place, and people like me basically try to study the mathematics to understand what's going on. And so part of our universe is uh, given to us by this thing called the classical path, and that's actually Sir Isaac Newton. Almost everybody in this room, I'm certain, has heard of this equation, f is equal to ma. And it's an equation that tells you how things move. But it doesn't just tell you how things move. It's, it also tells us how to get to the moon. For example, with the Apollo project back in uh, 1969, all we did was use Newton's equations for that purpose. It tells you how to, uh, how to build airplanes that travel at uh, hyperspeed velocity. I mean, Newton was just a bad guy, a bad cat. And he gave us this as a species. And the thing that's really interesting is he invented calculus. And it's really funny because calculus is the answer to the question. And the question is, what is motion? And you don't, I know a lot of people never get a chance to take calculus, but you don't really understand motion until you actually take calculus. That's a very strange statement, but it's literally true that you have some sense of what motion is, but if you really want to deeply understand what is motion, you actually have to learn calculus. Kind of weird result. So that's what Newton gave us. Worked really well for a long time for building technology. But in the, 19, uh, in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, what we learned was that when you look at things like electrons, they don't obey F is equal ma. The equations that describe the motion of electrons are very much more complicated. And in fact, a whole new piece of physics was invented for this purpose. It's called quantum mechanics. And quantum mechanics, by the way, is very weird. I don't know how many of you may have seen um, the Elegant Universe uh, TV series, which I appeared in uh, in the 90s. You might not recognize me because I had long black hair in those days. But uh, my parents never liked my hair long. And so my mother and father eventually got their way. But I'm talking about mother nature and father time. Because as you can see, it's no longer long and black anymore. And so I tell people I'm making do with what I got. I'm working with what I got left over. But um, you know these things? A lot of you walk around with these things. Uh, if you don't like quantum mechanics and what it says about the universe, Take this off and throw it away. The reason is because these things are designed to work precisely because quantum mechanics works. 
And so you can't use computers. If you, you know, it's hypocritical to say, I don't believe in all this weirdness that physicists are talking about. I don't believe it. And you walk around with this mobile device attached to your person because these things are built on that same weirdness that you don't believe. So quantum mechanics is extraordinarily useful. It's also the most accurate piece of science that our species has ever invented. There's a, one thing that quantum mechanics predicts. Electrons act like little magnets. And quantum mechanics let you measure how strong the magnetic property of electrons is. And this is a, a set of calculations and observations that have been going on for decades. And this is the only piece of science humanity has ever invented where the experimental results and the theoretical mathematical basis have been checked to one part in a billion. There is nothing else that humanity has ever done in science that is as accurate as that. So quantum mechanics are weird. It definitely seems to be the way our universe works. Now, of course, you can compare these two things. They're very different. And uh, Newton, F is equal MA, we even teach our high school students that. Right? You go to high school physics class and learn F is equal MA. Most high school students don't learn about this jiggly, wiggly, jagged path thing. And typically, only physicists really learn how to do this stuff. But we're kind, we'll share the results with you because that's how you get computers and smartphones and all that kind of stuff. And quantum mechanics works at the world of the very small, not in the everyday world where we exist, where we watch baseball and the Olympics. Because in fact, to describe what's going on there, Newton's equations work just fine. So they help athletes perform at Olympic levels. And that's all Newton's equations. But if you look at things like electrons and protons and things that are smaller than the atoms, that's where you have to use this alternate mathematics of quantum mechanics. And when you do that, you find out the world's more complicated than you thought. When I was in high school, we were told atoms are composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that was the end of the story. About the time I graduated from high school, that began to change. In 1969, we learned that inside of protons, there are smaller objects called quarks. And so that's some of what we have that we see listed here. This list of objects here are the kinds of things that quarks belong to. Now, protons and neutrons are just the first two. Two up quarks and one down quark is a proton. Two down quark and one up quark is a neutron. So there, you should think of these things as like bags that you throw little peanuts in and the quarks are the peanuts. That's one way to think of it. Um, but in fact, nature produces copies of the up and down quark. We call them charm and strange, and top and bottom. We don't know why nature has this copying process. Because most of what we can measure in the world only involves these two things, but yet for about 40 years, 40 or 50 years, we've been doing the science and observation about these other things. Uh, the electron is, in fact, the first elementary particle. The electron, um, uh, the electron actually was first an idea, which is actually very strange. Many of you have heard that the Greeks talked about atoms several thousand years ago, but in the 1840s, an electrochemist by the name of J.G. Stoney had a brilliant idea. He said, now the Greeks said the atom is the smallest piece of matter. Nothing smaller than an atom could exist. But J.G. Stoney said, no, something smaller than an atom can exist. And he actually gave this something a name. He called it the electron. Now, most people will know the story of the electron. They say J.J. Thompson, what have you. But in fact, J.J. Thompson was not the inventor of the idea, nor did he name it. It was actually J.G. Stoney, who was a Scottish electrochemist. And why did he want the electron to exist? Because he was trying to figure out how electroplating worked. Very practical reason for why he would say, aha, I can understand this if there's something smaller than an atom. And that's how science works. A science is about trying to have an accurate description of nature the most accurate description that we humans are capable. So the electron turns out to have friends. There's something in nature that is an exact copy of the electron, except that it's 200 times as heavy. It's called a mu particle. Uh, about 20 years ago, we discovered that this copying goes again. This other object called the tau particle is 1,700 times the, uh, the heavy mass of the electron. But in all other ways, it's an electron. So why this copying goes on, we don't know. But we observe it in our laboratory observations. And then I like to look at crowds like this and say, you know, I look at you and you're not just a soup of electrons and quarks. You're much more beautiful to look at. So why are you so pretty? Well, the answer turns out to be that in nature, there are other things that hold these little particles together in fixed shapes. They, the, they're forces. They actually cause the quarks to go inside the proton and neutron and stay there. 
The, that's called the strong nuclear force. There's a force that causes the electron to orbit around the, uh, the nucleus. That's the electromagnetic force. And when I was very young, there were lots of science fiction movies, and the monsters usually glowed from radioactivity. Now, that glow turns out not to be science fiction. There's a force in nature called the weak nuclear force, and you can actually see this glowing. It's called Cherenkov radiation if you set up the right uh, experimental situation. So this glow is not science fiction. It's actually something real. And so that's another force in nature. And it has a set of carriers that we call the W and Z bosons. And then, about uh, three years ago, we added the Higgs boson. We first saw the Higgs boson in Geneva, Switzerland. It had been predicted by our mathematics for about 35 years, 35 to 40 years. And that also should give you some insight into how people like me work. Now, um, I met a great group of physicists today, people who are really doing real stuff in the real world that has immediate implications. I, on the other hand, I tell people I'm the most useless kind of physicist that there is because I'm essentially almost a mathematician. And so what I'm mostly doing is playing around with mathematics, but in the service of trying to describe something uh, in nature. When I was very young, I used to say, I'm trying to find, discover some, a magical piece of mathematics that describes something hidden deep in nature. And in this talk, we're going to see one of what I think is my contribution to actually having done that. Uh, and over here, we have the gluons. They're the things that keep the quarks inside of protons and neutrons. So that was called the standard model. Now, it's not just a table. Like, you know, if you walk into a high school chemistry class, you'll see a, a table that has H on one side and HE on the other and a whole bunch of letters that are spread all about. And they'll say that's the table of elements. But that table of elements is not just a list. Because if you look very carefully, there are other numbers there, like the atomic number or the charge or the mass. And it turns out that all of that is part of mathematics of understanding how chemistry works. So what I've just shown you are the charts associated with elementary particles. But there's a whole set of mathematics tied to this. It's called the standard model. And that's the piece of mathematics that makes this prediction that agrees with nature to better than one part in a billion, the standard model. So people like me say, OK, well, we've made progress in physics, but uh, what's the future going to look like? So in 1973, I began my graduate education at MIT. I had done two undergraduate degrees uh, at MIT from 69 to 73. And I had, the fact that I have two deg undergraduate degrees is an accident. Because in fact, when I got to MIT, I wanted to, from high school, I had this wonderful physics teacher in high school that's why, one reason why I'm a big fan of teachers, because teachers open doorways in your lives. I had this great teacher in high school, Mr. Freeman Coney, an African-American gentleman, with an undergraduate degree in physics. Even today, this is almost impossible to find in this country, an under, a high school physics teacher with an undergraduate degree in physics. But I had such a guy, and he inspired me to become a physicist. Two weeks into his class, I knew it wasn't all of science that I wanted to do, because I had actually known about science since I was four, and had been thinking about how do you get to be a scientist. But when I was in Mystic Friedman's Coney's class, I knew it wasn't all of science, it was physics. So by 73, I had uh, gotten my uh, two bachelor's degrees, one math, one physics. That was an indication I actually always knew that I wanted to be a theoretical physicist. But like I said, you don't want me in anybody's lab. Let me just guarantee you that. Uh, if the dean were to bring me here and give me a lab full of equipment, I would be on his doorstep before he got back to his office asking for replacements because I would break everything in the lab. That's who I am. I'm just all thumbs or toes or whatever when it comes to experimental equipment. But with math, I'm OK. In fact, I see math in sort of different ways from most people. So uh, in 72, I was trying to figure out, uh, sorry, in 75, I was trying to figure out, how can I write a PhD thesis so that I get to the next step? Because I want to be a physicist all my life. And physicists typically work in universities. That meant I had to try to become a professor. And so uh, I was in graduate school, and I think, oh my god, this is horrible. There are all these smart people around. There are geniuses. How is someone like me going to make it here? And so one thing I started to think about was, well, what is, what, what is it that's peculiar about me, that's my skill set distingu that distinguishes me from other people? And I realized it's because I actually see mathematics differently from other people. This is something I had discovered when I was an undergraduate. And I can talk offline about how I made that discovery. But I, knew that there's a, there's a subconscious part of my mind that actually interacts with solving mathematics problems. 
because I had experienced it enough times as an undergraduate to know that this app was really running in there. So I said, I need to rely on that thing. But I have to find the right setting. And so therefore, I went and looked at all the physics in my part of the discipline, what papers people were writing, and then I decided, that's what I'm going to do. It's something called supersymmetry. It had only been discovered two years before I was trying to figure out how to write this thesis. And that made it a fair competition. Because you see, something two years old, that meant that all those smart, genius professors knew as little about it or as much about it as I did. It made it a fair competition. And so I said, I'm going to do that. I went to my professor at MIT and said, I want to change what I'm doing. I want to work on this stuff called supersymmetry. And he said, well, I don't actually know anything about that. And then he thought for a minute, he said, actually, nobody at MIT knows anything about this subject. So how are you going to write this thesis? And I said, well, A, since this is a new subject, the research literature is actually very small. That means that I, as an individual person, could read every single thing that anyone in the world knew about this subject. That means you get to the front of the line very quickly. And then the second thing was he had some confidence that I knew how to do something useful. And so he said, I'm going to let you do this, but you have to come to me every Friday and give me a seminar on what you've learned that week. And that's how I produced my thesis. And so in 1977, I finished it. I tried to convince other people at MIT that this was a very important thing. Nobody else, nobody else at MIT said, oh, you know. And so there's this, this, this crazy black kid running around talking about super. All right? So who's going to believe this guy, right? It's not like the Black Panther has shown up. <laughs> but by 77, I had actually done it. I had to produce a thesis, the subject. And in my thesis, I had discussed things no one else in the world had seen before. I was, in fact, the world's expert on this subject when I got my PhD thesis. This is a cover to of my thesis from 1977. And so what did I do? Well, well, first of all, why did I, why did I choose to work on supersymmetry? Well, a lot of reasons. First of all, because I wanted to have a life as a physicist. And I figured one thing that you have to be able to do is to prove to people that you can bring something of value intellectually to what the collective group does. And so what I recognized in supersymmetry was the following. I showed you the standard model at two slides back. Those are all the particles that we've ever seen in laboratories. But let me show you those particles in a slightly different display. So this is the photon, the carrier electromagnetic force. Those are the eight gluons, keep the quarks inside. Here's the Higgs boson, here are the WZ particles. Over here we have the electron. Uh, electrons can either spin clockwise or counterclockwise. And that's why you see two E's here. One of them is a clockwise rotating electron, the other is a counterclockwise rotating electron. The same thing for the mu particle and the tau particle. And then in nature, there are other things that look almost like electrons, but they have no electrical charge. They're called neutrinos. And they also can spin either clockwise or anticlockwise. Here are the quarks, again, split into clockwise and anticlockwise pairs. And so this is what the standard model looks like if you ask, is the thing I'm looking at a carrier of a force? Or in other words, is it energy? That's this line. Or is it something the forces act upon? That's what, these two, uh, that's what these two rows indicate. But you also notice there are two columns. And these columns are actually very interesting. If you take a flashlight and go in a dusty room and aim the flashlights at right angles to each other and turn the lights on, you'll notice that the light beams go right through each other. Nothing's, perhaps some of you have actually seen that, so there's nothing surprising there. And what that tells you is that light is capable of, one light particle, a photon, is actually capable of passing through Another light particle, at least if you forget about quantum mechanics, there's a little bit of complication there. But classically, light passes through light. Now imagine doing this thing, the same result with two electrons, right? Take two electrons, try to shoot them each other, at each other. Or better yet, let's start with baseballs. Let's take two baseballs and throw them at each other at right angles. When they get to the collision point at the same time, do they pass right through each other? No, they bounce off. Now for baseballs, the reason they do that is mostly electrical. It's mostly electrical repulsion because they're full of electrons and the electrons are repelling each other. But even if you turn off the charge on an electron, it turns out it's still something that's a property that looks a little bit like bouncing off. It's called the uh, Pauli exclusion principle. In quantum mechanics, you learn this because, and in chemistry, you learn this because you learn the shell structure of the atoms. Two electrons in the lowest shell, eight in the next shell. That's actually this bouncing off property at work. And so you can say, aha. Everything in this column has this bouncing off property. Everything in that column doesn't have the bouncing off property. It passes through each other. 
That's the difference between what we call bosons and fermions. And if you look at the standard model, these are all the particles that we see in the laboratory. So question, does this look pretty to you? Or let me state it in a more technical way. Does this look balanced to you? Or let me state it in an even more technical way. Does this look symmetric to you? Now, if you answer yes to any of those questions, I want you to leave this room. <laughs> because, <laughs> because for most of us, looking at this picture, we say, no, it's terribly unbalanced. And so what if our universe looked like that? Now, that's not completely balanced. This now has left-right balance, but not up-and-down balance. But it's more balanced than the previous picture. So let's go back. This is what we've seen in the laboratory. This is what supersymmetry suggests is the case. And this is what I understood when I was a graduate student at MIT, that we got more symmetry if we believed in supersymmetry. And so these, all of these extra things, all of their, they're just math. They're just mathematics. And so I study the mathematics of these things. I wrote the first thesis at MIT on the subject. We have not seen them in the lab, and we can come back and talk about that. Thank you. Not yet do we see them. Because remember, we only saw the Higgs boson three years ago for the first time, but it had been in mathematics for over 35 years. So just because you don't see something at a given time doesn't mean that it's an inaccurate description of nature. You have to keep probing, and that's why the experimental and observational work in physics is so important, because we want to know what's the most accurate answer out there. And why do we want to know the most accurate answer? because we're trying to get more and more technology, better technology. I tell people science is one of the best ways I know to, uh, to actually uh, ensure the survival of our species. Because at some point, environment's gonna change, like maybe global warming is not a joke. And how are we gonna save ourselves? It's gonna be technology. Where does that technology come from? Science. So science is in fact an act of self-protection for our species. In the context where nature changes the conditions that we exist in. So I, like I said, studied this and I'm like, wow, this is certainly amazing. And of course, for me, it's a playground. Because, you know, when you get to study right at the edge of theoretical physics, you're doing stuff that very few people get a chance to see or do. And it comes, and it's a little bit like writing novels. You know what a novelist does. They take, uh, they take punctuation and letters and words, and they tell stories. If you're a theoretical physics, physicist, you take mathematics and tell stories. You tell stories about how nature works. And so it's a lot of fun, like being creative. A lot of people think that physicists or mathematicians or a lot of engineers, don't, we don't have creativity in what we do. When in fact, we can't do what we do without creativity is the actual case. So there's enormous amounts of creativity in what we do. It's not just going in a white coat and turning on a flipping a switch or, or just sitting and doing some dumb, can you get this, this side of the equation to equal that side of the equation, which is a lot, a lot of people, that's their view of what we do. But what we're actually doing is telling stories. We're telling stories in the service of deepening humanity's understanding. So I got a chance to tell some new stories with this math. And I made numbers of discoveries. One of them uh, I'll come to in a little while. So now everyone, um, for those of you who do not like mathematics, please do this. Because this is what I actually do. This is a form of calculus that most of you will never get to. These are what are called supersymmetric equations. It's what I started doing when I was uh, a graduate student at MIT studying equations like this. And so this is how we actually do our work, is that we study equations. This particular set of equations includes half an electron with this object here. This is sort of mathematically half an electron, like maybe just the clockwise spinning part, but not the counterclockwise spinning part. But you can see it's buried in a bunch of things. And in fact, uh, this is the, if this were the electron, these things are we call selectrons. They're things that we haven't seen in the laboratory, but they share many properties of the electron. Let me go backwards a moment and tell the story slightly differently. Um, so over here in this chart, you can see the electron here. Here are its so-called superpartners. So this, it, for electron, selectron, both clockwise and counterclockwise spinning. Uh, up over here, we have the muon. 
uh, that thing that's 200 times as heavy as the electron? There. Over here, we have the smuon, the supersymmetric partner to the electron. Over here, we have the tau particle. Over here, we have the stau particle. So even though we've never seen these things, they actually all have names. Uh, here's the photon that carries the electromagnetic force. Over here is its superpartner called the photino. Uh, here we have the Higgs boson, which was discovered just a few years ago. This is a thing called the Higgs xenon. And in fact, what's really interesting about the Higgs particle is supersymmetry actually says they're not just one Higgs, but they're five. So this is one of the things that they're going to be looking for at the LHC is, can you see more than one Higgs boson? Um, this is the particle called the Z particle. This is a superpartner called the, Z, uh, the Zeno. Here's the W particle. And this is my favorite particle in the list of superpartners. Its name is spelled W-I-N-O. <laughs> so if you ever see a headline that says W-I-N-O seen in Geneva, <laughs> they will not be talking about an alcoholic specialist. So as I said, it's about equations, and there's no getting around. If you don't like the math, you can't do this stuff. On the other hand, if you do this stuff, you find the math is just another language. It's just like if you're writing a musical, if you're writing music, you have to learn to score. Right? You got to learn how to score. It's the same thing, exact same thing. We're telling stories with math. So those equations uh, describe these so-called superpartners. And there are some problems with those. You can write more complicated versions of these equations. And there are some problems that have not been solved in over 40 years with these more complicated versions. I first met one of these in 1979 when I was a postdoc at Harvard. And I was invited to come out to Caltech to work with a guy named John Schwartz, who was, in fact, the, uh, the, one of the inventors of superstring theory, which happened a few years later after I had met him. We, I went out there. He wanted to solve this problem. We worked on it for about six weeks or maybe two months, and we utterly failed. This problem has never been solved. And so that happened to me uh, in 1979, 80. In 1995, I was already a tenured professor. In fact, I was almost a full professor by that point. I had tenure. And I decided that this problem that I had not been able to solve in the, when I was a young person, and which no one in the world had solved since then, I was going to return to look at that problem. Also, I decided that part of the reason no one had solved it is because we physicists didn't, weren't asking the right questions about the problem. We needed a change of perspective. And so I'm going to tell you about my change of perspective. We're going to go from equations to pictures. So here's a picture. This is a picture of something Einstein told us. Einstein said that you, as an intelligent being, can affect the future, but only if, uh, only if you are connected to the effect you have by something that travels less than the speed of light. Well, if you're shining light being at the speed of light, or if you're throwing a ball, something less than the speed of light. It's what's called the future cone. Einstein also said anything in the past can only affect you if it's connected in what we call the past light cone. But there are regions of reality out here where not, you can neither affect nor can they affect you. These other regions are sometimes called the elsewhere, which is one of my favorite words, the elsewhere, like elsewhere, the elsewhere. And so using this construct from, that comes to us from Einstein, I start looking at the equations for supersymmetry. And I real, uh, let me just move a little past here. I realized, and these are, so what I'm showing here are simpler versions of the equation. But I realized working with one of my students, a young woman named Lubna Rana, who's my only a female PhD student I've graduated in my career, that Equations like this, and these are super equations, or at least simpler versions of the equations I showed you before, every piece of mathematical information here is actually contained in this picture. Now, in physics, we have ideas like this before. They're called Feynman diagrams, where you can take a set of pictures and then use them to calculate physical properties of a system. So it's not like I invented this idea, but we found that these super equations lead to these kinds of pictures. And we also found what I'm showing you there. Um, it turns out that if you take one of these pictures and try to understand these equations, and someone says, do an integral, you do what I just showed you. It's just a piece of macrame, a bunch of beads and strings tied together. And then when someone says, do an integral, you simply lift up one of the beads. I often say, wouldn't it be great if that's all we had to do in calculus class? <laughs> right? When a teacher comes in and gives you a bunch of beads and says, do an integral, you say, OK, teach. <laughs> all right? How much fun would that be? Right? So these objects, as I said, contain enormous amounts of mathematical information, even though 
They just look like pictures, or technically graphs is the word. Um, that second picture that I showed you is actually slightly different. I won't, con uh, if you ask me offline, I'll explain the difference. But the equations here are actually slightly different from the ones that we started with. They actually are an integral. In fact, it's this thing F that was integrated between the two sets of equations. So we found these graphs. Now I'm going to start trying to do physics. Because we take Einstein's light cone idea, and we take the four dimensional equations, and we sort of pass them through the light cone to see what kind of pictures you get from them, what kind of graphs are generated. And so you get these graphs. This is an example uh, that you get. These are the, this is that uh, the clockwise spinning electron has actually four pieces. That's what you see up there. Here are the superpartners, so-called uh, selectron superpartners. We can do this for the photon. Whoops. Do it for the photon. Here we see the photon at the bottom of the graph. And then supersymmetry says photon, photino. Remember, we had to go across the table with the superpartners. And then finally, the final thing I'll show you is string theory, which many of us believe will ultimately be proven to be the most accurate description of gravity and quantum mechanics, always includes an object like this. Uh, this is something called the dilatino, and these are so-called axions. And so if supersymmetry actually turns out to be accurate, we're going to be studying equations like this in the future uh, related to the gravitational force. These are some more of these images. Much more complicated sets of equations, but still, this passing through the light cone generates these things with a well-defined prescription. Here's another set. Another. Another. And as I show you these pictures, I hope you get a sense of the hidden beauty that was always there in the mathematics. In fact, Albert Einstein said at the, I'm not, it's not an exact quote, but Albert Einstein said something like, at their highest levels of practice, art and science coalesce in plasticity, form, and uh, aesthetics. And that's perhaps what we're seeing here, how the mathematics ties itself together with art. These are my favorite. I've often long said, I wish I knew someone who knew how to weave these so I could have wall hangings. And I could, someone says, well, what do you do? And I just point at my wall hangings. That's, that's what I do. So these graphs are peculiar. They have math buried in them. So I'm going to start now telling you about the mathematics. It turns out that all of these things are built on basically little squares that you glue together. Um, so here is a square. Everybody recognizes that. And if you know some mathematics, you know that you want to talk about the locations of these tips. And you do that with these numbers that you see here. Now, what's really interesting is these numbers are only plus and minus ones. And minus one is equal, I'm sorry, minus one is equal to itself. But plus one is equal to minus one to the zero power. But that means that squares are described by minus 1 to the 0 power or minus 1 to the 1 power. A variable that takes on two variables, I'm sorry, a quantity that takes on two values, 1s and zeros, have a name in computer science. They're called bits. And so if you start with squares, they automatically bring bits with them. And so when we study these the, the full equations, what we found is these bits were always there. Now, as I said earlier, uh, it's only a bunch of plus and minus signs that you have to work, and then the bits you get by exponentiating. And so all the dots that you see in my pictures have bit addresses assigned to them. It's as if they want to be parts of computer science, just automatically. Not because I wanted them to do, but because squares can always be talked about in terms of plus and minus ones. Uh, and so this is the story. Uh, this is a story about Feynman and Wheeler. Uh, Feynman uh, and Wheeler were both. Uh, I'm sorry. Feynman and Thorne were both Wheeler students. And in the 60s, at some point, um, Wheeler. I'm sorry. Um, Thorne was visiting Feynman, and uh, Thorne was saying that his that both their advisor was starting to lose it, just like I thought he was starting to lose it. And so Feynman says. Uh, um, so Feynman says, "Yeah, I know. This guy sounds crazy," and he's talking about Wheeler. But what people of your generation don't know is that he's always sounded crazy. But when I was his student, I discovered that if you take one of his crazy ideas and you unwrap the layers of craziness from it one after another, like lifting the layers off an onion, 
at the heart of the idea, you will often find a very powerful kernel of truth. Feynman then goes on to relate that one day when he was in Wheeler's office, Wheeler said, wouldn't it be interesting if the positron, the antiparticle electron, was an electron moving backwards in time? If you know relativistic quantum field theory, you know that's the secret of something called QED, and that's what won Feynman the Nobel Prize. So it starts as this crazy statement from his advisor one day. Um, it turns out these collections of beads, like macrame, you can actually fold them up sometimes. And so here's a movie that's actually mathematically correct. I actually was working through equations, created a storyboard, and took it to a computer graphics animator. And I'm going to take this initial object and fold it up. Here I'm doing three integrals. Uh, I'm going to do some more, uh, or derivatives, I can't remember which now. And now the trick is I want to show that the left side and the right side are actually exactly the same. This tingling you saw was plus and minus signs. If you put a minus sign on both sides, the equation is still valid. And so now we're going to twist these, fold these two things together. And you'll notice there's perfect matching. Black rods to black rods, black balls to black balls, uh, white balls to white, dash blues to dash blues, uh, dash reds to dash reds, solid reds, solid reds. That's a proof that the two parts of this diagram are, in fact, images of each other. And it turns out, and we open this back up, and this actually gives us uh, the description of half an electron. The thing I started with turns out to be a description of the photon in, some, in what we call a, a particular gauge. But this movie then shows that the mathematics of photons, which was invented by Maxwell in the 1860s, although it didn't get widely known to the treatise in the 1870s, that the mathematics of electrons and the mathematics <laughs> of photons are related to each other in some way, because we never had to break any links in doing this. This is what you would need for unified field theory. You would need a piece of mathematics that you look at it one way, it gives you the math of uh, photons. You look at it another way, it gives you the math of electrons. And if you have more complicated things like strings, it should actually be able to give you all the math to describe everything that's in the world around you. And yet, in this toy example, this isn't string theory. This is just studying supersymmetry. We have begun to see these kinds of links. Now, what I showed you before looks really complicated. Let me go one more transparency. I started with this thing, and I claimed I folded it up. Let me give you the bitwise addresses associated with this object. There they are. 000, zero, zero for the first one, or four zeros. Uh, one zero zero. That just means that I use a red link to go from here to here. Whenever I use a red link, I change the first bit by adding one. Uh, when, I change a, uh, when I use a green link, I change uh, the second bit. So if I t uh, go from here to here, I would have to change the, f uh, the first and second bits to one. That would get me over here. And so you can easily see that this bitwise addresses, in fact, associate with each vertex. The folding I showed you was this, when you actually work the folding out detail, this node actually got folded together with that node. This node here was folded together with that node. The node down here got folded in together with that one. You see what's going on? If you add the addresses of things that are getting folded, they're always add up to the same thing. One, 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 one. Now, when I, this is work that I did, uh, and I, let me just, uh, at this point, make sure you understand. This isn't, I work in a collaboration. In fact, I created a group of both mathematics, mathematicians and physicists to study these objects. I discovered these objects with my student, but then it became clear to me that if we we're going to make progress, we got to be talking. And that's one of the things that, again, students generally don't understand about academia, is that in research, it's all about collaboration at some level. You're always constantly talking to people. The story about the genius that goes and locks themselves in a room and comes out with, uh, uh, with the tablets uh, like, uh, like Moses, that doesn't happen in the real world. You interact with your colleagues. You feed on their knowledge, they feed on your knowledge. It's a collaborative process. And that's why one of the shifts in university uh, education these days is that we try to teach our students from the very beginning that they have to be more collaborative. When I was a student, that was not a big message. At many universities now, that's a big message. Learn how to collaborate. So that's what goes on. And so we found these bits. What's special about 1111? Well, my colleague here could answer that question for you, but I'm going to take a shot at it as an amateur. 
Uh, in a digital communication, when you have a device that creates ones and zeros to communicate messages, and by the way, that's all you do when you type on your computer or when you talk on your cell phone or when you're looking at uh, streaming video, all you're doing is looking at streams of ones and zeros. All of them are based on the transmissions of ones and zeros. That's digital communication. Now, when you have a device creating streams of ones and zeros, like you typing at your keyboard and then using Wi-Fi to send it to a second computer, in the real world, there's no such thing as perfect transmission. So sometimes when you create a one over here, when it gets to the receiving device, it reads it as a zero. Sometimes we create a zero here because of the, basically you can think of it like static in the, in, the, in the system, you get a one over here. And so in order to have reliable digital communication, you have to actually teach this second computer how to recognize when there was an error made in the transmission. This is a problem that a, a computer scientist named Hamming first thought about in the late 40s and early 50s, and he found a way to solve it. Uh, there's something called the Hamming Code, which is an example of how you solve this problem of reliable digital communication. And this set of numbers, 1111, is an example of a, uh, one of the families of such codes uh, that exists. The largest member of this family is something called the checksum Hamming Code. But this one, this one with just four ones, it's the smallest example of one of these kind of error correcting codes. And so we come to the conclusion that if the world is supersymmetric, that is, you want to get the balance, then computer codes are tied into the mathematics of the universe. Not that we are talking about computers, but in the mathematical description of how the universe works, computer codes suddenly appear. Now, when I and my collaborators first found this, we were astounded. In fact, we were so astounded that for about six months we didn't talk to each other. We wrote a paper, we presented this result, the paper got rejected because we couldn't get the referee to understand what was in the paper. By the way, that often happens in physics. That's not an odd occurrence. I see laughter in the audience, so some people know that this is true. But we, we ourselves didn't talk about it. But then, just like I'm speaking with you today, I often speak to the public. And so in one of my public presentations, someone I said, what are you do? What are you doing right now? I explained this. And I said, well, what does that actually mean? And so then I started worrying, well, what? What could it mean? Well, it could mean, and a lot of people believe this, but please don't believe that I believe this, it could mean that the Matrix science fiction movies are real. A lot of people look at my work and say, wait a minute, this guy has found, in the equations that may describe our universe, this guy has found error correcting codes uh, in the Matrix movies, you can imagine that there are scientists. How does the Matrix actually work? Well, it's a virtual reality. And so the, if you study its laws of physics, you probably wind up looking at computer code, right? And so they say, aha, therefore, Professor Gates believes in the Matrix. And if you go on the YouTube, by the way, you'll find many, many websites where this statement is made about me. <laughs> Needless to say, I'm not very appreciative. And besides, there's a real problem. This is part of what's called the simulation hypothesis, and lots of people now are talking about it. And the problem with the simulation hypothesis, as I noted in an article in the Washington Post several years ago, I said, if you believe that we are all in a virtual reality, that you know, that's what we are, we're programs, essentially, then you have to accept the existence of the possibility of ghosts. Why? Well, if we're programs, Unless the underlying device that's running those programs is destroyed, when we die, it's basically just like ending a program. But when you end a program, that doesn't destroy the program. You just reinitialize. And so if you really believe that we live in the matrix, you have to believe that the, our universe is consistent with the idea of ghost. I don't think our universe works that way. I've not seen any evidence that it works that way. And so that's one of the big problems with the simulation hypothesis. Another problem is, you can't falsify it. And that's a more fundamental problem, because in science, you have to agree when you present an idea how someone will prove that you're wrong. You have to do that, or else it's not science. And there's a problem with the simulation hypothesis is that you, there's no way to prove that it's wrong inside of that logical system. And the final issue with the simulation hypothesis, which is when I first began to understand why people would sort of take my work and take it in really weird directions, um, is um, some people interpret uh, our discovery uh, by saying, um, 
they know who the programmer is. It's the deity. It's the creator. And in fact, if you look at the simulation hypothesis and take the word programmer and replace it by God, the logical structure is exactly the same. So that's not what I was taught how science looks. So I, I vehemently do not believe we live in the matrix. So what is the importance of my work? Well, I can't say for sure, because in science, uh, what one, what one, uh, what the best that one can do is wait until nature gives you the evidence. You do the experiment. You make the observation. That's how science works. You can do all this fancy math that you want. You can come up with all these strange ideas. But until nature verifies that with an observation, it's speculation. So I don't really know. But let me continue. Uh, this is the problem, by the way. Uh, this is a version of the problem that I first saw with uh, John Schwartz in 1979. It goes as follows. So this object here turns out to be uh, one of the object that's related to the half the electron. Uh, the object over here is the same picture, except that I've erased all of the upper superstructure. So you can see the bottoms are exactly the same. And so the question becomes, if I started from this, is there a set of mathematical manipulations that would allow me to reconstruct that? Now, this problem, which I've just described to you in about three sentences, is a, a tiny version of the problem that no one has ever solved in my field. Now, the real problem has many more colors. It has many more dots. But that problem of reconstructing the diagram from partial information has never been solved in supersymmetry. Uh, here's another example of the problem. If you start from this, can you reconstruct that? The answer turns out to be yes in both of these cases. In fact, curiously enough, uh, my daughter, I have a daughter who's in uh, about three quarters of her way through her third year of graduate school in the PhD program at Harvard. When she was an undergraduate, I did research with her. And we actually wrote a paper where we, she actually was the first person that actually wrote code that showed how to start from these things and reconstruct those. So we have some demonstration, validation and demonstration that you can take some partial diagrams and reconstruct them. But this 40-year-old unsolved problem, no one has solved that answer, and I haven't yet. But we think we're on the right track for doing that. Um, so I often work with undergraduates. Uh, on this paper here, Forrest Guyton, Sid Hallmarker, David Kessler, and Victor uh, Mazaros are all undergraduates. Because the work that I'm doing is so avant-garde, I have to worry about my, if I had graduate students, I'd have to worry about them getting postdocs. And so the only people I worked with for the last couple of years have been undergraduate students, because when they apply to graduate school to say I have a paper in a referee journal looks pretty good in making an application. Or I work with tenured faculty who already don't have to worry about getting into grad school. But I haven't, for the last five, seven years, I haven't worked with people in that gap between graduate school and postdocs for this reason. Now, on the other hand, undergraduates are great. Anyone who's done research with undergraduates know undergraduates are just great. So I have a great group of undergraduates I interact with all the time. And in this paper, uh, we were studying some aspects of this problem of gluing things together and what have you. And uh, it turns out that uh, in this paper, we were able to study a pixel array of 36,864 pixels by 36,864 pixels. That's where this number 1.3 billion comes from. And with my students, we, uh, oh, I should also say with Vadim, who's actually is curious. Vadim is a researcher with Goddard, but I taught him as an undergraduate about six years ago. So these are, in some sense, all of these are my students. But he, He's actually gone off and done something useful. So we studied these things. And what we found is we are now in the realm. So you know, here's equations again. Oh, God, let's get that stuff gone. But this is the information that's in those equations. This is a small sector of that big pixel array that I told you about. So we are now in the process of trying to learn how to use techniques from computer vision to study aspects of the equation, because we know how to generate these pixels away. Again, it comes from this passing through the Einstein cone. And so I'm very interested in talking to computer scientists these days about how you do computer vision. Because the problem I have is I have equations in four dimensions. I pass them through this thing. I get these pixel arrays in one dimension. And the question is, 
how do you identify those four-dimensional four objects in the pixel arrays? And this is a problem in computer vision, as far as I understand. And so we learn things like this, that the equations that I rush past you are actually points. Oops, I'm sorry. Are actually points on a tetrahedron. So, computer codes, laws of physics, how could that possibly happen? Well, I only know one way to answer this question. I'm a scientist. And if you ask me a question that I don't know the answer to, I start thinking about science that I understand. If you look at science and ask a question about where else in science, not in engineering, such as we would be doing for us, and not in computer science, but in natural sciences, where else is there a discussion of error correcting codes? There's only one other piece of science I know where such discussions occur, it's in genetics. And therefore, if these error correcting codes are significant, because maybe it doesn't mean anything, but if they're significant, my proposal is we should look at the model of genetics to try to explain this to us. So how does it work in genetics? Well, in genetics, you can imagine genomes with and without error correcting codes. And genomes without error correcting codes propagate offspring that often are mutant and not viable. A genome with an error correcting code, all it has to allow mutation, otherwise you don't get evolution, but the cost to the system of producing offspring that are uh, not viable is much, much lower. And so that's why we think that error correcting codes in biology confer an evolutionary advantage. So if I use this as a model, then the crazy thing that comes to my mind is that maybe, just maybe, we live in a universe where something like evolution acted on its mathematical laws. Now, in order, in order for this to happen, we, we would have to change our picture about the meaning of the Big Bang. Because the conventional meaning of the Big Bang says that our universe was created and then we evolved forward. But suppose that when the Big Bang occurred, multiple universes were created with different sets of mathematical laws. Then you have something like the diverse starting point that you have in biology, and then maybe if supersymmetry is discovered in our universe, it's because supersymmetry confers an evolutionary advantage to our universe as the universe sorts out all these possibilities. And that evolutionary advantage has to do with the stability of the vacuum. So I'm asking the craziest question of my career right now. Is evolution part of the laws of fundamental physics? So this is a representation of DNA, the author of all of us and of all life on Earth, with its base pairs. And we can read those off in uh, graphs. And maybe, just maybe, we live in a universe where error correcting codes and something like the genome actually establish the mathematical laws of our universe. Thank you. Oh, you're going to take the microphone? Okay. Thank you uh, for the talk. Uh, I want to ask you a very quick question. Because of the way your pictures looked and because you mentioned computer vision, have you considered any connection with the feed-forward neural networks? Because they... Yeah. I, well, first Thank of all, I, I'm very much aware that a lot of work that goes on in AI is if you have a compl complex system where you don't understand what the rules are, you throw it on a neural network and you let the network learn and teach, uh, at least identify correlations. Uh, yes, I'm aware of the fact that we could try something like that. I'm no expert in neural networks. In fact, I barely know anything about computers. Uh, but yes, that's an open avenue. I'm open to finding collaborators who might know a whole lot more about that. And we can certainly give them these large 1.3 billion uh, pixel data sets. And if they can figure out how, and I'm willing to talk to them what we're looking for, and if they can find algorithms or to teach a neural net to identify the shadow of these four-dimensional equations, I'm going to jump for joy. Hi. 
I'm a geneticist, not a physicist, physicist and I'm just really intrigued by your um, um, taking this back to our polymerases, our natural error correctors. And so you started this lecture by saying that in quantum mechanics that the, the um, bit error rate is one part in a billion. And in genetics- I'm sorry, let me just say, it wasn't the bit error rate I was talking about. I was talking about a specific observation is one part in a billion. Okay. And, and so, in, in, at least in the world of genetics, we know that we have a very high fidelity for our polymerases. Otherwise, none of us would be here. And, right. and what we don't know is what how many um, um, failed missions there are following conception right. um, to, um, to correct that, because I think these issues happen early on. So my question is this, though. So you're trying to, 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 to graphically represent supersymmetry equations into these complex of DINCRAs, and you then have, a presume, bin these bits, binary bits that are in, and then a potential error correcting process that might be evolutionarily conferred. How do you know that, that any DINCRA that, that fits a model where you have an error correcting process Failure? that works oh. for that DINCRA is real and not Artifact because I, I know that my proteins I know that my polymerases work because my proteins work and I'm right, here. Right. How do you know that yeah, because yeah. bits are bits? Believe it or not, I have an answer for that question. So it turns out that I tried to introduce this sort of it looks a little bit like uh, it's not real protein folding but you know toy protein folding and that's the way I try to explain this and the role of the error correcting codes. So you could have asked me a technical question, which is, Professor Gates, suppose I started with that big picture that you, you showed us, and I decided to uh, unite nodes in a different way from the one that you did. I would tell you it would fail and because it would not maintain the supersymmetry of the four-dimensional equations. So in my context, work means to maintain that left-right balance that we expect to find in our world. How is that not a tautological argument. I'm hearing I am because I am. No, you're hearing other ways of folding fail to support that, that symmetry. That's a different statement. The symmetry goes away with other folding, uh, the ones that don't obey the error correcting codes. So I'm not, it's not just I am. Although I'm a big fan of, uh, what is that movie? Um, Charlton Heston and uh, Ten Commandments. And I am. Uh, good evening. Um, just my thought is when you're talking about, the last thing you were talking about is sort of the idea of multiple universes where rules might be different. Uh, and drawing the analogy with evolution, I'm, I'm trying to anticipate or think about what would be the consequence of, of the failure of a system. I mean, what yeah. would happen to a universe? Sure. So as I said, the best we can answer that question has to do with the stability of the vacuum. It turns out in that wiggly jiggly picture of the universe that I showed you, quantum mechanics, the notion of the state of nothingness is a very delicate question. And for about 70 years or so, people like me who have worked in what's called relativistic quantum field theory, there's, uh, there are certain infinities that we kind of sweep under the rug. In the systems with supersymmetry, these infinite constants do not occur. And so when you try to define the vacuum, it actually has a much better definition than when you have to uh, throw away infinite constants. And so uh, the advantage, we think, is about the stability of the vacuum. The, st the stability of the definition of the state of nothingness. One more question. Wonderful presentation, thank you. Thank you. Um, at the most fundamental level, what is energy? So for a person like me, uh, there are several different answers to that. One of them is that it is the um, generator of time translations, which is a technical answer, but it's true. Um, another way that I could answer the question is, uh, if you allow me to look at particles as excitations in the Hilbert space, then energy is, um, is the quantity I get by calculating the Hamiltonian. 
So I can give you lots and lots of technical definitions of energy, but they're all about instructions of carrying out calculations in a specific context. That's it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming.